Hi, in this video we talk about analytic geometry. We will cover not only Euclidean but also curved spaces as well, but primarily we will focus on Euclidean geometry. So what is analytic geometry? We have seen the axiomatic structure of uh, geometries, which means that uh, we provide a set of axioms that are talking of the properties of points and lines. However, we want to do computer graphics, so we want to get the computer to work with geometry. And the computer is never able to deal with abstract terms like axioms, points, lines, intersection, etc. A computer can deal with numbers, so these concepts should be translated to numbers or computations generally speaking, to an algebra, which is just a collection of numbers, operations, equations, functions, etc. If the geometric concepts are available in some algebraic form, then it's pretty easy to translate it further to a, say, C++ implementation. So we have to find a correspondence between geometric concepts and an algebra. This correspondence should reflect the axioms. Having established this correspondence, uh, we can forget the axioms because the correspondence itself encodes the knowledge of the axioms. And from this point, we can deal with only numbers, operations, equations as required by the computer. So this is analytic geometry, doing geometry with numbers. The possibility of expressing geometric concepts as numbers is provided by the coordinate systems. Here we are going to take an external view, which means that our geometry is embedded in a higher dimensional space. So, for example, when we talk of two-dimensional planar geometry, this two-dimensional plane is included in a three-dimensional space, and when we discuss three-dimensional geometry, the geometry is embedded in a four-dimensional ambient space. The advantage of this extra dimension is that we can discuss not only Euclidean, but also non-Euclidean geometries as well. Of course, it would be rather challenging to depict four-dimensional spaces on PowerPoint slides. Therefore, in figures, I always describe the situation when we embed the two-dimensional plane in a three-dimensional ambient space. So, this is our ambient space. When we deal with two-dimensional geometry, the ambient space is three-dimensional, and we have an extra coordinate in addition to the xy Cartesian coordinates, and this extra coordinate is w. I use w instead of z, because in three-dimensional geometry we will have the Cartesian coordinates x, y, z, and w is added as an extra dimension. So a point in this ambient world is described by three numbers, x, y, and w. And for such points, or triplets, we assume the operations of addition, when uh, coordinates are added independently, and scaling or multiplication with a scalar, when uh, all three coordinates are multiplied by the same number. Different geometries are embedded in this ambient space. For example, the two-dimensional Euclidean geometry is a plane in this three-dimensional ambient space defined by equation W is equal to 1. So it means that a point is a member of this geometry if its coordinates are x, y, where x and y can take an arbitrary value, but the third extra coordinate must be equal to 1. In order to describe spherical geometry, the spherical geometry is embedded into this ambient space as a unit sphere. The unit sphere is defined by this equation. This equation is nothing but the square of the distance of a point from uh, the ambient origin. And this square of the distance is equal to 1, so indeed we have a unit sphere. Recall that in spherical geometry, instead of the sphere, we in fact have just a half sphere, because uh, points are diameters, or in other words, opposite points, also called antipodal points, are equivalent. 
Hyperbolic geometry can also be embedded in this three-dimensional ambient space as a one-sheet hyperboloid having the following equation. And finally, we can also embed the projective plane into this three-dimensional ambient world. The embedding is very similar to the embedding of the Euclidean geometry, but here, for the projective plane, we get rid of the extra dimension differently. Note that for Euclidean, spherical and hyperbolic geometries, we reduce the dimension from 3 to 2 by imposing an additional equation that should be matched for a point to be part of the geometry. In the case of the projective plane, however, we say that points of the projective geometry are in fact lines in the ambient space that go through the ambient origin. Or in other words, all points on these lines are equivalent, they are identifying the same point in projective geometry. There is one additional issue. Euclidean, spherical and hyperbolic geometries are metric, so we have the notion of distance and angles. So we need the concept of scalar product in ambient space as well. This scalar product is the usual scalar product for Euclidean geometry and spherical geometry, but we will use a special scalar product for hyperbolic geometry, which means that the ambient space itself has an Euclidean structure for the Euclidean planar geometry and for the spherical geometry, but the ambient space follows the rules of Minkowski geometry here. The difference can be imagined by considering the theorem of Pythagoras as well. According to the theorem of Pythagoras, this is just the square of the distance from the ambient origin. In Minkowski geometry, the Pythagoras theorem is reformulated into the following form. So when we add the squares of the legs of a triangle, then when it comes to the extra coordinate, we have to use a negative sign. So interestingly, assuming Minkowski ambient space, this is also a sphere, because uh, this says that the square distance from the ambient origin is constant for all points of the hyperbolic geometry. Let's focus on Euclidean planar geometry. We need a metric, so we need the magic wand behind um, distances and angles, which is nothing but the scalar product, the scalar product defined in the ambient space. So we use the Euclidean interpretation of the scalar product in the three-dimensional ambient space. Coordinates are multiplied together independently, and the three coordinate products are added. It is easy to see that such operation is commutative, distributive, and can be exchanged with a scalar multiplication. Euclidean geometry is embedded into the ambient space by requiring the extra coordinate w to be equal to 1. So points of the Euclidean geometry must have a coordinate triplet where the first two Cartesian coordinates are extended with a constant 1 value. You may ask why we do not embed the Euclidean plane with definition w equals to 0. Well, there are good reasons for that. One of the reasons is the following. We will want to express transformations, like for example, translation or scaling by matrix multiplication. And it would be impossible for the translation if the ambient origin was also part of the Euclidean geometry. And it's easy to see why. If we have the ambient origin, its coordinates are all zero. If we multiply such a vector with a matrix, the result will be zero no matter what the matrix is. On the other hand, translation must modify all points without exception. So the ambient origin cannot be part of the geometry because translation cannot be expressed for it as a matrix multiplication. So that's why we use the w equals 1 restriction instead. So these are the points in our geometry.
What about the vectors? Vectors are directions between two points. A vector is not allowed to point out of the geometry. So from one point, the vector can point just into the direction of another point. We can also say that vectors are in fact the differences of two points. The constant one value in the extra coordinate would disappear, so we can conclude that uh, valid vectors must have a zero in the W position. Otherwise, the vector would point out of the geometry. So summarizing in two-dimensional Euclidean geometry, a point is described by three numbers, and the third number is one for points and zero for vectors. Let us examine the properties of vectors. A vector is just the separation of two points. If a point is considered as an ambient space vector, then the vector of our geometry is just the difference of these ambient space points. Vectors cannot point out of the Euclidean geometry, therefore their extra W coordinate is zero. It can also be seen by considering that uh, the point's W coordinate is 1, so when we compute the difference of two points, the extra coordinate um, will be 0 in the result. The length of a vector can be computed by multiplying the vector with itself using the rules of the dot product and computing the square root of the result. Since in vectors the third component is zero, only the first two Cartesian coordinates show up in the length formula. This is nothing but the theorem of Pythagoras. From every non-zero vector, we can create a unit length vector, also called unit vector. The vector should be divided by its length. If we have a vector v, we can find vectors that are perpendicular to it. Two vectors are perpendicular if their dot product is zero. Let us denote the components of uh, the perpendicular vector by x perpendicular and y perpendicular. And um, using the formula of the dot product, the dot product of the orthogonal vector and the original vector can be expressed in this way. So we can solve a linear equation for unknown um, coordinates x perpendicular and y perpendicular. And the solution of this uh, linear equation is shown here. So, so if we have a vector with uh, coordinates x, y, 0, then uh, all other vectors that can be expressed in this form are perpendicular to it. And finally, we can recognize the parallel property as well by checking the coordinates. So two vectors are parallel if they have the same direction, but their lengths might be different. So one vector can be obtained from another vector by applying a scaling operation. And this scaling can be applied for the coordinates too. Okay, having points and vectors, the next step is the introduction of lines. A line is a constant speed motion in geometries, which can be expressed in this algebraic form, where P is the starting point of the motion, and V is the velocity vector of uh, the motion, or in other words, the direction of the motion. And we can imagine T as time. If we compute the time derivative of this motion, the derivative will be equal to V, so indeed we have a constant speed motion because V is a constant vector and is independent of T. If we compute the second derivative, which means the acceleration, the second derivative will always be zero. Recall how we defined the Gaussian curvature. First, we used the definition of the directional curvature, which is the curvature of a curve in a given direction. The curvature of a curve is just the centripetal acceleration assuming unit speed motion. In our case, the acceleration, including the centripetal acceleration, is constant zero in an arbitrary direction. 
then the Gaussian curvature is just the product of the maximum and the minimum directional curvatures. However, in this case, all directional curvatures are zero, therefore the Gaussian curvature is also zero. So Euclidean geometry is a zero curvature geometry. The line can also be expressed with coordinates. So points have three coordinates that can be functions of time. And according to the definition of the constant speed motion, we separate it into the starting point, P, and a time-dependent term, which is just the velocity multiplied by the time. As the starting point is a point, the extra coordinate is 1, and as the velocity is a vector, its extra coordinate is 0. Note that this is the right way of assigning this extra coordinate because in this way, for arbitrary t value, we get a 1 value in the result, so the result will always be a point in our Euclidean geometry. On the other hand, a vector is just the difference of two points. So let us select two points P and Q on our line and express V as the difference of the two points. Our uh, line equation looks like this, p plus the velocity vector, which is now the difference of the two points multiplied by t, the time. This formula can be reorganized in the following way, which is called the combination of two points. By combination, we mean that we take points, multiply them, with the scalar values and add them up, and we expect the scalar values to result in 1 if they are added together. And this is exactly the case here, because 1 minus t plus t is always equal to 1. So the line is just a combination of two points, which can also be expressed with coordinates. No, both p and q are points of Euclidean geometry, so their extra w coordinates must be 1. This is the right way, because if we look at this extra coordinate, 1 times 1 minus t plus 1 times t is equal to 1, so in the result the extra coordinate is 1. Points of the line are indeed points of our Euclidean geometry. Finally, we can give a third interpretation to the line using the external view of the ambient space. A line in Euclidean geometry is just the intersection of two planes in our three-dimensional ambient space. One plane is the geometry itself, defined with equation W is equal to 1, and the other plane is defined by three points, the ambient origin, and P, Q, the two points identifying the line. This interpretation is important because this interpretation is valid not only in Euclidean geometry, but also in spherical and hyperbolic geometries as well. So when it comes to the definition of lines in hyperbolic geometry, for example, this is just the intersection of the hyperboloid and the plane defined by two points in the geometry and the ambient origin. This equation is called the parametric equation of the line because we have a scalar parameter which might be interpreted as the time. There is another way of expressing the points belonging to a line. We can use an implicit form, which doesn't have any extra parameters. So far, we have defined the line as a constant speed motion. We also know that in the geometry, we can find vectors that are perpendicular to a given vector. Now, we find vector n that is perpendicular to the direction vector v of the line. This perpendicular vector is called the normal vector of the line. So the normal vector is perpendicular to v, which means that the dot product of the normal vector and the direction vector of the line must be equal to zero. v, the direction vector, is just the difference of an arbitrary point r on the line and the starting point of the line denoted by p. Having made this substitution, we arrive at an equation for unknown points R, which is called the implicit equation of the line. 
Indeed, if we have a point R, substituting into this equation, we can determine whether this point R is on the line or not. This equation can also be expressed in coordinates, as n is a vector of our Euclidean geometry, its extra component is zero. R minus P is also a vector, because both R and P are points. So in the vector, the set coordinate is zero again. And then we use the formula of the dot product. So the x coordinates are multiplied, the y coordinates are multiplied, and the two multiplications are added and result in the well known formula of uh, the two dimensional line. But we can also observe that the scalar parameters of x and y are nothing but the two Cartesian components of the normal vector. And the third component is just the dot product of the normal vector and p, the starting point of the motion, multiplied by minus 1. So a line can be identified by three parameters, the two components of the normal vector and this d. So this triplet is, in fact, the line. Ambient space points are also triplets because we need three coordinates to identify a point in ambient space. So we can say that lines with these three parameters are also members of our ambient space. So if we use this interpretation, the equation of a line is nothing but a scalar product, where we multiply the vectors of nx, ny, and d with x, y, and 1. So generally speaking, the line equation is just a dot product of the triplet of the line and the triplet of the point. And this dot product should be equal to zero in order for the point to be on the line. Of course, we know that points are members of our Euclidean geometry if their w value is 1. This equation is an equation of the plane. In fact, the equation of this plane, defined by the ambient origin and point P and vector V. So this interpretation means, again, that our line is just the intersection of two planes, the plane of uh, the ambient origin P and V, and the plane of the geometry identified by W equals 1. Finally, we call two lines identical if the same set of points belong to the two lines. Looking at the equation of the line, obviously the roots x, y pairs wouldn't change if we multiply both sides of this equation by an arbitrary number. So as a result, if we consider the line as a triplet of three parameters, the same line can be expressed in infinitely many different ways if all three parameters are multiplied by the same number. Two lines are equivalent if the triplet of one line can be obtained from the triplet of the other line by a scalar multiplication. After discussing two-dimensional planar geometry, let us consider the Euclidean geometry of the three-dimensional space. There will be no more figures after this point, because when we embed the three-dimensional Euclidean geometry into the four-dimensional ambient space, we lose the ability to depict geometric arrangements. But we can still use the correspondence or analogy between the two-dimensional planar geometry and the three-dimensional geometry of the space. So, no, the ambient space is four-dimensional. An ambient space vector is represented by four numbers. In the ambient space, we still use the scalar product, where uh, coordinates are multiplied together independently, and the results of the multiplications are added. Recall that this dot product is responsible for introducing metric in our Euclidean geometry, including the determination of lengths and angles.
So in this four-dimensional ambient space, points of the three-dimensional Euclidean geometry are described by four element vectors where the force coordinate is equal to one. Using the dot product, we can express the distance between two points as the length of the vector between the two points. The vector between the two points is obtained as a simple difference of the two four element vectors. Similarly, we can introduce the notion of uh, angle. Recall that the dot product is just the multiplication of the length of the two vectors multiplied by the cosine of their angle. So from this definition, we can express the angle as the arc cosine of the dot product divided by the product of the two absolute values. In the ambient space, we have not only points, but also vectors. Vectors can be recognized by checking the force ambient coordinate, which must be equal to zero, in order for a vector not to point out of the Euclidean space. The computation of the length of a vector is based on the dot product, so we multiply the vector with itself and uh, calculate the square root. As the force ambient coordinate of vectors, as the force ambient coordinate of vectors is equal to zero, this w coordinate doesn't show up in the length formula, so we get back the well-known formula for the computation of the length of a three-dimensional vector. In three-dimensional Euclidean geometry, planes will be like lines in the two-dimensional Euclidean geometry. For example, the implicit equation of a plane is similar to the implicit equation of a line, but we have to use one more coordinate. You might think that we had too much mathematics, so let's jump into programming. What do we need from this theoretical stuff when we want to exploit Euclidean planes and Euclidean three-dimensional spaces in our computer programs? We will need primarily a structure or class called VEC4 or uh, four element vectors that can represent vectors in our ambient space. And as we have seen, these vectors can be points in the three dimensional Euclidean geometry, also vectors in the three dimensional geometry, not to mention planes in the three dimensional geometry. So this VEC4 can define not only vectors, but also so points, planes, and uh, we can even add colors because uh, we know that colors can be decomposed to red, green, and blue components. And if we add the opacity as a force component, a color also needs four scalar values for its definition. So a VEC4 has four float variables, x, y, z, w, and if we want VEC4 to represent a three-dimensional vector, then the w coordinate is set to zero. If it should represent a point, then the w coordinate is one. If it is a plane, then the x, y, z components are just the coordinates of the normal vector of the plane, and the force W component is the D parameter of the plane that describes the offset of the plane from the origin of our ambient space using the units of the normal vector. So what can we do with VEC4 objects? We can construct it. This constructor just fills up the four components. An ambient space vector can be scaled by a number s when all components are multiplied. We can add two four element vectors, which means that components are added independently. Similarly, we can subtract. Finally, if we had addition and uh, subtraction, as an analogy, we can introduce an element-wise uh, multiplication when x, y, z, and w are multiplied together independently. And the result is also a VEC4 type object. Note that addition and subtraction even show the type of the result. So, for example, when we add two vectors, so the W coordinates are zero. In the result, the W coordinate will also be zero. So the addition of two vectors is also a vector. 
when we add a point and a vector, which means the translation of the point by the vector, then the point's w coordinate is 1 and the vector's w coordinate is 0. So in the result, we have a 1 value in the w coordinate, which means that the result is a point. Indeed, when we translate a point by a vector, we obtain a point. It makes sense to subtract one vector from another. When the w coordinates are 0, so is uh, the w coordinate of the result, which means that the difference of two vectors is a vector. When we subtract a vector from a point, then we get a point as a result. And when we subtract one point from another point, both w coordinates are 1, the result will be 0, so the difference of two points is a vector. Concerning the element-wise multiplication, this operation doesn't make sense for vectors, points, or planes, but it is really useful for uh, colors because uh, when we know the own color of a surface and the color emitted by a light source, then the color reflected will be just the element-wise multiplication of the light source color and the surface color. Different wavelengths can be handled independently in uh, color computation. We will learn why it has deep roots in physics. In addition to these basic operations, we will have the dot product, which is responsible for introducing lengths and angles. So the calculation of the dot product is just uh, the multiplication of the coordinates independently and adding up the result. We can multiply two vectors when the w coordinates are zero, so this term doesn't affect the result. Or this dot product is also useful when we want to check whether a point is on the plane or not. In that case, A is the four element vector of the point where the W coordinate is 1, and B is the four element vector representing the plane where the W coordinate is just the D parameter, the offset from the origin. And if this dot product results in zero, then the point is on the plane. Otherwise, it is not on the plane. By uh, checking the sign of the result, we can determine whether it is on one side of the plane or on the other side of the plane. For vectors, we can compute the length. The length is just the square root of the dot product of the vector with itself. A vector can be normalized, which means that we find a vector that points into the same direction but has unit lengths. So normalization means a scaling with the length of the vector. And finally, we can combine two points. It is also called linear interpolation. So P and Q are points, and T is a scalar parameter. If T runs in the unit interval between 0 and 1, with this formula we can generate points on the line segment defined by P and Q. Or if T can take an arbitrary value, then this formula generates points on the line defined by points P and Q. The VAC4 class and uh, these additional global functions are just the summary of the mathematical knowledge of Euclidean geometry when it is embedded in a four-dimensional ambient space. Well, sometimes we decide not to represent this x or w coordinate explicitly because we know whether an object is a vector or a point. But of course, we will not be able to represent the planes or four element colors, including the opacity as well. But we save some memory. So VEX3 is a simplification of the VEX4 structure introduced earlier. It can also be constructed. We can scale a vector. We can add two vectors, even two colors, or we can add the point and the vector. And similarly, we can subtract two vectors. We can subtract two points. We can subtract a vector from a point. The difference between this VEX3 and the previously introduced VEX4 is that we will not be able to detect the type of the result by checking the W coordinate. 
If we have VAC3, then the dot product is able to compute the dot product of two vectors, but obviously this function is not appropriate for determining whether a point is on the plane or not. We have not only the dot product, but also the cross product in the three-dimensional space, which can be evaluated by this formula. That concludes our chapter on analytic Euclidean geometry. So let me summarize the most important messages. We have to use an analytic approach to geometry because the computer cannot do anything else but to deal with numbers. Expressing geometric concepts with numbers means that we have to use coordinates in a coordinate system. It might be surprising, but we took an external view, which means that when we have a space, either two-dimensional or three-dimensional, we embedded this space into a higher dimensional space, and we call this higher dimensional space as the ambient space. So the ambient space is three-dimensional when we deal with two-dimensional Euclidean geometry, and the ambient space is four-dimensional when we consider three-dimensional Euclidean geometry. This gives us an extra coordinate, W, and this extra coordinate for Euclidean geometry and for points is equal to 1, and for vectors it's equal to 0. This strategy can also be applied for non-Euclidean geometries, like spherical, hyperbolic, or projective geometries. But in those cases, points, vectors are represented differently as elements of the ambient space. In metric geometries, like the Euclidean geometry, we need the definition of the dot product because both the length and the angle are derived from the dot product. The line was introduced as a constant speed motion. The line is also the shortest path, also called geodesic between two points. And this is true for any geometries, not only for Euclidean geometry. Finally, we have seen that on the programming level, we need just a class or structure called VAC3 that is able to store four float values representing the four coordinates of the ambient space. Sometimes we get rid of the extra coordinates, so this VAC4 can be VAC3 and even VAC2 if we handle the missing coordinates implicitly. So this really concludes this chapter. Thanks for your attention.